keep that. I have already explained uh, this uh, before, the position of the heart uh, in the giraffe relative to the brain and relative to the toes, and by comparison to humans. And these are the mechanisms by which the giraffe prevents its blood system from collapsing. It has very thick blood vessels in the legs and thin ones uh, in the neck, right? So for, to cater for the differences in the hydrostatic pressures. And it has reservoirs of blood so that when it goes down, that blood doesn't rush into the brain, it stays somewhere in the, in the pools more or less. Okay? The same way you would plumb your, your water system. So these are the questions. What determines the giraffe's long neck? What are the sequences in the DNA, the differences? And uh, so uh, how do we find the responsible sequences? We compare giraffe with other mammals, but also with his closest relative, the okapi. Okay. So I will not go into the details of the data, but essentially sequencing genomes of animals or plants or microbes is now an industrial science. The first genome of human was sequenced over a period of, I think, 10, 15 years. It involved the whole world, okay? And it cost $3 billion, one person, $3 billion, okay? Now, you can sequence your genome for $600, right? And you get the, the data in one day, eight hours, okay? So it's industrial scale, three billion, eight hours, six hundred dollars. And uh, their program sequence human genomes. I think the NHS is debating whether to start sequencing the genomes of all its patients so that they can do specialized, individualized uh, medicine. Okay. I think there is a proposal to that extent. Okay. So uh, these are the analyses we we did. We looked at. Uh, there are certain tools. We looked at uh, the, the frequency of it. If you take a specific segment in the, in the alignment from Okapi and, the, for example, a giraffe, you can use the Poisson distribution to see what is the hazard rate or the, 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 the frequency of differences uh, appearing in uniform segments, and then you can get some indication of whether it is fast developing or not, or fast evolving or not. But I, I will not go too much, and this is where you are, all your data analysis, the machine learning and whatever are all in this one slide. That's not the point for this presentation. Okay? So we've got the three period letters covering 95% of the genome, replicated it in three individuals, with period letters from Okapi as well, and compared with existing data from 17 mammals, cows, kangaroos, whales, humans, dogs, cats, and everything. So there is a huge data set in there. Okay. And uh, uh, what did we find? We have established, now this is the results, okay, that uh, the, the evolutionary distance between giraffe and okapi, they diverged about 11 million years ago. This is from DNA sequence data, okay? Uh, and uh, when you compare the segment, the genes, where the okapi is so diverged from giraffe, yeah, and you do some enrichment magic analysis between pathways and stuff, then you can get which biochemical processes are most distinct between okapi and giraffe, okay? And this list here uh, gives you the ones which are most statistically significant after corrections, I don't know, Bonferroni or whatever. You guys do that better than I do. And these are the corrected p-values. So mitochondrial disease, uh, genes or pathways. Right now there's a big case about a patient in Europe, in Britain, who has mitochondrial disease. Okay? So I think mitochondria is now a common balance. 
you can see a cell migration, cell proliferation, ossification, remember bones, we talked about it, uh, axon, these are the pathways for transmitting nerves, okay, the neurons, vision, bone development, angiogenesis is about heart and the blood vessel development, okay? So these are the biochemical processes that are most distinct between okapi and giraffe and all other animals, okay? So this is where the, the, the reason for the long neck and the adaptation lies in these uh, few lines, okay? So when you present them in a slightly different way, you can see cardiovascular genes, genes involved in cardiovascular function, heart pressure, I don't know, whatever, neuro development and function, and skeletal development and function. Those are the three main pathways or processes that are different between giraffe and okapi. But you can see some of the genes are cutting across all the three processes, showing the interconnections between biological processes. Okay. And this is another way of representing those sets of genes, looking at how they interact with each other in function. Either one gene controls another gene's function, or the product of one gene is a substrate of another gene. And this is the, the network. Okay. I think visualization, someone talked about that before. Uh, I skip that. So, remember I told you there's a gene when they treated chicken embryos with a chemical, they got long necks, right? This, this is it. Yeah? It's very different in a giraffe, yeah, compared to cow. The dots, haha. <laughs> A movement from one platform to another, right? They should all be dots up to the other side. Uh, so the A's here are the sites where giraffe is different from all other mammals, okapi and cow. Okay? And uh, we see this, this, these five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters might be the ones responsible for the long neck development in the giraffe. Uh, the other thing which is very interesting is this pathway. These genes, one, two, three, four, five, are involved in the metabolism of uh, butyric acid. That's the, one of the main sources of energy for ruminants, cows, goats, sheep, giraffe, and stuff like that. Okay? When these animals eat grass, they ferment it in their poor stomach, and then they get fatty acids, volatile fatty acids, and one of those volatile fatty acids is butyric acid. And these are all uh, genes encoding enzymes which work in the mitochondria, right? Incidentally, each of these genes in humans is associated with, if there is mutation in any of these genes, in one of these genes in humans, the clinical signs of those humans is associated with blood pressure, hypertension, heart function. Okay? So although these are enzymes working on a metabolite which is coming from the stomach, perturbing them affects the blood and heart function. So we think these are targets for development or maybe therapies or whatever for human heart disease, right? From weather opportunities. Now, I'm about to finish, don't worry. How many minutes? Five. Good, thank you. You've seen this picture, but I think it's slightly different, right? So it's the same picture you saw earlier, it's a network. And uh, we are supposed to generate scientific hypothesis. So this is one of the hypotheses, okay? But I will come back to this slide. Okay, now story. Imagine that you have one loaf of bread, French bread, okay? And you have a set number of guests, say 10, for dinner, 
Okay? And uh, after they done their wine and the prisoner to say, Well, Bina is ready, he say you give them a buffet like we have just come from, and each one of them comes with a plate. And you know they're 12. So you start slicing your bread one at a time. Right? Now, suppose as you do that, a few more guests arrive. What will you do? Maybe you've sliced three slices, three more guests arrive. What will you do? You are only one bread. You are not Jesus. <laughs> right? So you slice your slices a little bit thinner, right? Slices will be thinner because you want everyone to get equal pieces. Eh? Now, as you get halfway of slicing your French bread, another few guests arrive. What will you do? They will still get even thinner slices. Okay? Now, suppose then you tell them, don't eat your slice. Just keep it on the plate. And uh, you are now going to serve them the whatever you're going to serve later on, food or whatever. And you look at how big the slice is of the plate, is the proportion, you say, I will serve you proportionately the food to the slice you got. So the guys who got a longer slice will get a bigger uh, meal, and probably they will put on a little bit more weight for, for that day or that night, right? So this is what we think happens. Because during embryo development, there is a tissue which grows out from the head backwards. And remember there was a clock. It is supposed to go and slice up that into piece segments which will form your vertebrae, right? And this tissue, as it grows, the clock is slicing. Yeah? Maybe at the beginning, it slices, you know, big, big, and then to the, the rate of growth reduces. Oh, I have to slice 30, make 30 slices so it begins to make them smaller. So since it's starting from the head, these are bigger, and towards the tail, they will be smaller. And remember, this is an embryo. So now you start to give these segments environment to grow. They will grow proportionately to their original size. So long neck and long four legs and smaller, shorter back and shorter legs as they appear in the giraffe. Okay? That's the diminishing bread hypothesis to explain the, why the giraffe looks asymmetrical, I mean the disproportionately anterior compared to the back end. Now, let's come back to this one meal. Remember, the Lamarck and Darwin said they needed, the giraffe needed to get to the leaves high up in the tree, although they concluded different things. What were they looking for in those leaves? Nutrition. Nutrients. Now, when you look at all these genes, you find some of them are involved in vitamin A, metabolism, acquisition and conversion, right? And I understand from animal health people, human health people, vitamin A is very, very important, right? Okay, that's what the giraffe says here as well. Uh, folic acid, vitamin B9, I think in this part of the world, the pregnant woman is supposed to be given these tablets for growth, eh? Spina bifida, okay? Leaves, again. And then these genes here which are responsible for the moderation of how the skeleton or the, the body segments are sliced together. So I think by starting off looking at a string of, or a very long set of strings of ACGTs, we are able to home in onto a very small proportion of that huge data set and find genes represented by those the, uh, strings of letters, which can be indicators to how we develop uh, interventions, maybe in humans and livestock, and uh, gives us a clue on how diseases might evolve, especially genetic disorders in humans and in other animals.
Okay. And that, I think, marks the end of my presentation. This is what we want to do. We are going to change some goats into long necks. There are new tools for doing that, right? Genome editing, okay? And uh, this is the people we worked with, mainly in Penn State University and here, okay? And uh, this is what my grandmother told me, right? Thank you very much for listening. So you mentioned there were 71 mutations in the genes. Were these in the coding regions? Well, and were the, if they were, were there additional non-coding region mutations? Okay. So, so all the work that is presented today is based on coding DNA sequences. So there is a huge amount of data that we haven't looked at. The non-coding part, duplications and other stuff. Which we are still looking through that data set. Yeah. So 17 genes coding sequence. Thank you, Maurice, for that uh, presentation. I wonder, how, how, what's the distance between having this information and moving to a, I mean, like, interfering with the... Now doing the gene editing and things like that. Uh, what is what? What, is, I mean, what needs to happen? What needs to happen? Is there a person from government here? <laughs> okay. So, so I will speak freely, huh? Uh, Idi Amin said freedom of speech, huh? Not freedom after speech. Do I have both of them? <laughs> So, so, <laughs> so, so the, the, what needs to happen, there are several things. From a purely scientific point of view, nothing needs, there's no block. It, it will probably be about uh, $10,000. That's all I need. Well, maybe more, including a PhD student, uh, all right, to get the reagents. Because the gene editing process, I think, is very, that huge. Now the hurdles come from regulation. That's why I asked about government. And I think if you allow me, I will dwell a little bit on that. Because in many cases, the people who are in the regulatory positions are impeding, in some cases, at least in this case, the advancement of science by Africans. Right? So we used samples from USA, in a zoo in USA, because I could not get samples, DNA samples of a giraffe from Tanzania, Uganda, da da da, da. I got one from Kenya through a friend, not through. <laughs> yeah? All right? So, so the regulation uh, is uh, the other thing. But uh, what, what we are doing, is uh, because of the relationship with the USA, the Penn State University, so we're already doing the gene editing in cell, cell cultures. We do the process in embryos and in mice and then later on goats. Secondly, at uh, the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya, in the collaboration with the Rosalind Institute, Edinburgh University, we have set up uh, a center for tropical livestock health and genetics, genetics and health, All right? And uh, in that center, in the labs in Nairobi, we'll be able to do gene editing for chickens and cows and whatever, right? For confined, for research only, right? I have to, to, to be very specific on that. For research purposes only. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Now, no one remembered the fish. Uh, do I have a second? Sure. So, so the other projects, as we are 
working on the gods to take time, right? Uh, we are working on, on, on that fish, which is the African lamb fish. You saw the water, it, it can live in a, it, it's a fish that lives in water, but if the pond dries out, it can stay in a completely dried out pond for years, four years, five years, right? Asleep, and when the rain comes back, it will start off again. So I'm interested in this particular uh, species because with my colleagues in Uganda, we want to be able to feed, to, to, to produce feed in drought or climate uh, changing or variability environment. So there are all these uh, valid dams for water, for livestock in dry areas, but when the drought comes, these water bodies dry out. So we want to be able to, to put in fish during the rainy season, when the dry, drought comes, the fish will remain there until the next rain and they start off from there and so you can be able to solve some food security issues.